Kesi Bai, and he is the senior vice president for global initiative and strategy at the Institute for Global Engagement. He served as the coordinating lead in the development of the institute, institutional partnership and global initiative strategy, as well as overseeing IGE external outreach and communication. You have 50 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Greetings to all of you and, and thank you for being here. I'm, I'm honored uh, to be in the presence of such distinguished guests and, and experts uh, on this most important topic. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm Christy Vines. I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Initiatives and Strategy at the Institute for Global Engagement. And uh, I'm just proud and honored to uh, serve as a co-convener with, uh, alongside our partners, uh, Archbishop Charles Bowe and the Venerable Sinigu Sayado, uh, and our uh, partners, Jensen Research Center and the Myanmar Council of Churches. And this afternoon, uh, after such a provocative uh, dialogue and conversation earlier, I just want to follow that up. Uh, you know, we're talking about peace, harmony and, and coexistence, and we really can't do that without a discussion on the role of women, and especially women of faith and peace building. And so that is the topic that I'd like to address and, and discuss today. If we really are thinking about finding serious solutions and, and answers to some of our, our greatest conflicts and challenges, we really can't address that without thinking about and considering the role that women play in that issue and to do it explicitly and intentionally, and thinking about it as a common problem or a common stakeholder as opposed to just a women's issue. Uh, I don't even have this in my notes, but I always am reminded that uh, when we come to events like this, especially when we talk about issues of religion, as I look out into the audience, I'm usually met with the faces of men. And, uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, but uh, but it, is, it is rare, but certainly, uh, improving to see the, the faces of women who are actively engaged in peace building around the world. Uh, turning to a specific conversation about Africa and Asia, um, currently in Africa and Asia alone, 39 countries are in a state of war and conflict approximately 200 conflict zones and just these two and just these two continents now certainly these aren't necessarily state conflicts some of them are internal community-based conflicts but nevertheless conflicts and challenges to be addressed as a result of these conflicts over 90 percent of the casualties will not be soldiers will not be state actors but will be innocent civilians 70% of which are women and children. And I would like to posit that as a faith community, that should be unacceptable to all of us. I want to turn just to an initial conversation and discussion about the victims of conflict, uh, especially women, who are often, uh, and in large part, the greatest victims of conflict but also a, a discussion uh, that I myself uh, heard and learned at a panel that I was on a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a fellow panelist who works on uh, conflict issues in Africa made a, a very important point. The point of which was, in conflict, while death is often an inevitable outcome, women do die differently than men. And while men certainly die directly as a, you know, a direct or indirect result of conflict, uh, in large part, women die far more brutally, often with uh, violent wounds and, and, and the evidence of anger, violence. It's not unheard of to find a woman lying dead with a spear from one end and out the other, uh, or who have been murdered after already being brutally sodomized or raped. 
For those that escape death in conflict, we certainly know that by far women are trafficked far more in conflict, they're raped far more in conflict, and suffer at the hands of, of violent attacks far more often and regularly as a result of conflict and in conflict zones. So what has become clear, and even to the international community, is that no longer are soldiers the greatest victims of war. It's women, women and children, who comprise the greatest victims. And so for that, we absolutely need to find solutions, we need to begin dialogue, we need to continue the conversation that's already happening at the international and national levels about how to protect women in conflict zones. The unfortunate part about women in conflict is it's been a part of our historical narrative since the beginning of time, so this is certainly nothing new. And it's an issue that's been talked about on a regular basis. Um, I'd like to use examples to talk about the role of women in peace building because I think it's far more interesting, it's far more relevant, um, and it certainly does a better job of talking about the role of women in peace building than I certainly can standing here and just talking to you. Um, because I believe the victims' voices are far more powerful than mine will ever be. Um, theory suggests that the inclusion of women in peace building processes can result in more sustainable <coughs> peace and resolutions that are far more long-lasting to the conflict, especially given that women typically are working at the grassroots level and not just empowering and equipping other women to speak into the conflict, but also engaging across divides, bridging what are traditionally uh, zones that men are unwilling to cross and in some cases are unable to cross. So there is certainly a, an important role for women and uh, Somaliland is, is a great example of that. Following the collapse of the country, male clan leaders lost control, elder clan leaders lost control of the young, much younger army, guerrilla army. And as a result, it opened up a space for women that, was, that previously did not exist. So in that case, we found that at the core of solutions, at the core of dialogue, while the male clan leaders were just simply trying to get control of the situation, the women were already working silently behind the scenes, trying to bring about a peace that would protect themselves, protect their families, but ultimately protect their countries. I would like to just start with a, a conversation that talks about the missing link to sustainable peace, which research has shown is, is women. As was the case in Somaliland, women <coughs> are frequently the first to take the big risk of <coughs> bringing about peace. Women's peace building efforts, while tending to have that grassroots approach, also it's really the spaces that women work which provide them with a unique access uh, and opportunity to start conversations to end the conflict. Women are often the bridge to fractured communities, uh, especially when in those communities it's, the fracture happens because of religious issues or, um, or other ethnic uh, tensions. Women are typically outside of the politics of those, those conflicts and, and those tensions and so are able to start dialoguing with the other women across the aisle far earlier than men traditionally can. The peace process usually begins before most of those in political power and those who are engaging in the conflict even know it's happening. And oftentimes, it's the women silently speaking into the issue, whether it's in the public square, in their markets as they go out, but also in their homes behind closed doors with their husbands that can catalyze initial dialogue and conversations about peace in a way that is very different than traditional peace building efforts. Women have also worked as peace envoys, uh, certainly without uh, often the authority to do so. So they work behind the scenes, 
uh, sometimes silently as peace envoys delivering messages between warring and, 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 and divided groups. And not just at risk to themselves, but at great risk to their families and to their communities. This was certainly the case in 2003, I don't know, uh, the Liberian Civil War that waged under the rule of Charles Taylor. Uh, the story and the narrative behind that <coughs> role that women played, uh, for some, may, some of you, you may be familiar with, uh, as it's been encapsulated in, in a narrative that's been published and also made into a movie, Pray the Devil Back to Hell. And I find that a provocative title, and I think even for those that know the story, and we'll actually see a clip of it, for those that know the story, most don't know where the title came from, which I think is actually probably in some ways equally as powerful as the story itself. And, and that is the story that, that, and the narrative that Charles Taylor, uh, then president of Liberia, was said to be as powerful or powerful enough to call the devil out of hell. And the women to counter that narrative and, and to, to encourage others to join the cause of peace said that it was really prayer that was going to, to send the devil back to hell. And so it was through prayer and really a dream uh, of Lema Gaboya, a Christian social worker, that first started the peace movement in Liberia and ultimately led to Charles Taylor fleeing the country. Uh, attempting to find safe haven in Sierra Leone until the women there decided that they they were going to stand with their sisters in, in Liberia. And it really was because of the actions of these women, 3,000 only, that uh, tra just transitioned the entire conflict. And so while you could hear this great story from me, it's far more powerful from her, and so I'm going to show a quick clip.
We are determined and nobody gonna deter us. <laughs> Gonna find a strategic point where Taylor gonna encounter us and give us some attention. And this is how we decided to sit at the fish market every day. Thousands of women, including ITPs, internally displaced persons, went. It was the first time in our history in Liberia where Muslim women and Christian women were coming together. And we had a big banner that said, the women of Liberia want peace now. <coughs> For those that don't know, that story um, and haven't don't know about uh, Lema. And she she actually won the Nobel Prize for for the work "Pray the Devil Back to Hell." Um, it's a powerful narrative, but it's a narrative that shouldn't be limited to Africa to Liberia. It's really a, a narrative that touches at the heart of, of every conflict in every part of the globe. Um, for sake of time, I'm just going to skip through some of this, but. For those of you that, that have kind of followed international uh, policies, we have in place UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which specifically addresses the role or the missing role of women in peace building efforts historically and has worked uh, to elevate the voices of women at the table of decision making and policy uh, when it comes to conflict transformation and strategies to end conflict and bring about peace. The problem is, is that until implementation happens of a resolution, there is, it's a piece of paper. And so where that has failed and where I think opportunity exists, and I think opportunity exists here in Burma, is to actually take the mandate of elevating women's voices, bringing them to the table of decision making, and not because just, not simply because they're women, and not simply because women are half of the population, and half of the population that, uh, that believe in a faith or don't or, or, or no faith at all, but they're, they're half. And when there's half, that's a significant stakeholder and that's significant power. And so I think it's been easy to marginalize women's voices, marginalize women's issues, as, and putting them in a room and saying, you figure out your stuff. You, you come back to us and tell us what you want to do for women. But rather, and, and research has shown, I mean, even our, our brothers and sisters in the private sector have, have gotten this right before those of us in the faith community have. And that's when there is diversity in, in gender, when there is diversity of gender at the highest levels, real change happens and real impact happens. And I think that is the case for peace building. I think it's the case for the future of Burma and the case for the, the future of our global peace. Uh, so I thank you for allowing me to, to talk to you today. Aminara Su Panado from